We've had a great response so far from our whiskey and whiskey episodes, uh, so I thought it'd be a good idea to look in a little bit more detail at some other whiskies from around the world. Today we're talking Japanese whiskey with James Raftery from the Japanese Quality Whiskey Society. We do have the link to them below. They have some really amazing products, so you should definitely check it out. We're going to do a couple of these style of episodes as well, so make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell and that way you won't miss out. I've discussed in some other episodes the fact that a lot of people equate sort of scotch with being all of this style of whiskey um, and kind of explaining that there's not such a thing as a Japanese scotch but there is a Japanese single bottle, a Japanese pure malt and um, Japanese blended whiskies. So they basically, you know, in Japan they kind of make all of the styles um, of whiskey that you would expect to find in Scotland as well. Yeah, look, they do and they, they do make it very much in the Scottish style more than the, the Irish or the American yeah. style. So I guess the fundamental difference is that all the Japanese whiskies are aged in Mizunara oak as opposed to the American or French or European oaks. It really changes the, the, the flavour and the texture of the whisky. So that's a, a tree that's native to Japan? Yeah, that's right. It's a native oak to Japan. So it's um, traditionally they were using the European oaks, mm -hmm. but during the, the First and Second World War, they couldn't get hold of the oak. Yeah. And so they changed over to using the Mizunara oak, which gives you a bit more of a sandalwood, coconut, um, and another incense called kara. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, interestingly yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, and what they found in the early stages was that it was the whiskey was very undrinkable in mm. the young stage, but the aged whiskies really uh, performed really well. So um, early on, they thought it was the, uh, the, the the lower quality choice, but they found over time that it actually produced beautiful aged whiskies. Yeah, and then so most a lot of Japanese whiskey that you see will be kind of um, on that older edge again, it's kind of similar to, to Scotch, where most stuff you'll see is kind of twelve years or so, as opposed to American whiskies, obviously kind of quite often four years and things like that. That's right. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. A, yeah. And because of the cooler climate that most of them are made in, they often age a lot slower too than if you make them in that American climate where it's quite warm and yeah, humid. Yeah, a lot of, so. a lot of <clears throat> out of the, the wood there. Yeah, that's right. So I guess whiskey wasn't kind of an uh, indigenous um, spirit for Japan. So where did that sort of come from? Yeah. Japanese were very isolated. They had an isolationist policy up until the end of the 1800s. Um, and uh, an American sailor by the name of Matthew Perry not the friend star, not Chandler, <laughs> <laughs> Chandler. Um, but uh, yeah, he was the first one to bring um, bring spirits to to Tokyo. He actually he kind of helped uh, spirits in, in general. Like distilling wasn't really a no, it wasn't thing understood here, right? in Japan that previously, and they, yeah. they realized how far behind they'd fallen in, in their isolation. Yeah, um, and they traded, and, and a lot of Japanese um, uh, people fell in love with the Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, and the first uh, Japanese uh, man to go over to Scotland was uh, Takatsuru. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he went over there in um, 1918 and stayed there for seven years, married a uh, Scottish girl. Which Jessie I do always Cole. think must have been quite confronting for him coming over and trying to understand our accents. <laughs> 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 would have been pretty full on, I would imagine. It'd but be incredible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then to meet a, a local girl and marry her must yeah. have been, in, yeah, and take her back. It would have been just as confronting for her, I guess, yeah. going back to live in Japan for the rest of her life. Yes. And, yeah, the, he's up the first distillery with Tori who was Tori of Sun Tori, um, which was Yamazaki, which was actually the second to There's another one just slightly earlier, four years earlier, which was Igashima, the one just over there. Um, and, uh, and then they eventually had a falling out and uh, Tori changed the company name to Sun Tori, which was just backwards of Tori-san, yeah. which means Mr. Tori. Yeah. So he just changed it around to sound more Western. Um, and then uh, uh, Takatsuru went off and started the Nikka brand up in Hokkaido. So both have done pretty well for themselves. I don't think either of them really, you know, <laughs> didn't do well out of that falling out. <laughs> no, it did very well. Uh, so obviously I guess our kind of theme today is is how hot Japanese whiskey is and it does seem to have a lot to do with, with supply and demand and there's just basically not enough supply for the demand. Are there particular reasons that are quite specific to Japan for that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons that feed into that. I think um, the main one is the Mizunara oak. We, 
which um, is in fairly limited supply. So the, the, the trees need to be at least uh, 200 years old before they can cut them and turn them into barrels. Yeah, wow. um, and then now the most expensive oak barrels in the world, much more than French. Well, or you can see why. American, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which, which tre the trees can be much younger when they're harvested and turned into barrels so you can have production going yeah. and making barrels regularly. Whereas the, there's a very limited supply of these barrels. So that really limits the amount of true Japanese production you can have yeah and then there's probably a second factor which is that um, I think a lot of the big distilleries quite like having a certain limited supply keeping the quality really really high yeah and then selling a lot of their other products with it so I think there's maybe not a not a huge will to fix the problem <laughs> <laughs> that's probably fair uh, yeah. Smart business. Yeah. so I see definitely over the bar now Japanese whiskey is is kind of one of the things that people will just come up and, and ask for kind of apropos to nothing um, it seems to be yeah very hot right now do you reckon there's a particular reason for that in terms of the flavor profile or is it just kind of a trendy well look I think that the main two reasons are because of the two Murrays Bill Murray and Jim Murray so, <laughs> Bill Murray in uh, in, in the famous yeah. uh, scene uh, where he says Suntory time yeah I think that that was the first sort of recognition of Japanese whiskey as something sort of interesting and special mm. um, and it's sort of built from there and then Jim Murray obviously rated uh, one of the Yamazakis as the, the best whiskey in the world which I think was the first time a whiskey outside of Scotland won that honor and I think that the combination of those two things in popular culture and then obviously um, you know the, the extremely high rating just really kicked off the trend in Japanese whiskey and then of course when things are in limited supply which Japanese whiskey is <clears throat> It becomes even greater demand, you know, yeah. so everyone sort of got on it, in on it with... Uh... Well, I guess that's the same problem. I mean, a lot of Scot um, Scottish whiskies are having the same problem where they didn't foresee, you know, 20 years ago that they were going to be this popular. Whiskey had a little bit of a dip and that's yeah. where you're seeing some age statements disappearing and things because yeah. obviously people just don't have enough 12-year-old or 15-year-old, 18-year-old whiskey to actually put into bottles just now. Um, so that's definitely something you see in, in Japanese whiskey is, for instance, Hibiki 12 is now really hard to get a hold of, but you have Hibiki Harmony. Yeah. So it's not all going to be, um, you know, 12 years isn't going to be the minimum there anymore, but it's kind of mimicking the same flavor profile. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's how they're sort of keeping themselves in the market. I guess the thing that I find a little bit hard as a bartender when people just come up and ask for a Japanese whiskeys and I'm like, well, what, we have a few, like, what are you actually looking for in it? Like, yeah. do you think there's kind of a quintessential Japanese whiskey flavor profile that people are looking for? Uh, yeah, look, I think that typically people would consider Japanese whiskies to be um, present with sandalwood, mm. um, as we said earlier, and, um, <clears throat> and coconut. And, and a little bit on the sweet and slightly more elegant style. I'd compare them as the difference between an Australian red wine and a French red wine. You know, yeah. it's, it's very much more elegant and sophisticated than the Scotch style, a lot less smoke, a lot less heavily peated. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you could almost describe them as a slightly more feminine Scotch yeah. rather than that sort of very masculine, very heavy Scotch. I guess it's not the, you know, using not using European or American oak or whatever, they therefore wouldn't then have much sherry influence ever. Or is there a Japanese fortified wine that kind of gets made in the cask first and then the whiskey put in? Yeah, look, they do they do, do both. Yeah. Although when they do sherry casks, um, like uh, the famous Habiki 21 year old yeah. is using a, a sherry style cask, they're actually mostly bringing those out of Europe. So they're sending the whiskey over, okay. barreling at the sherry casks and then bringing them back to Japan. So it's not Japan. the Mizunura? Is it Mizunura? No, no, it'll be usually pre-done in the Mizunara. Mizunara. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I struggle with that one too. <laughs> so you're going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then, and then they'll, they'll finish it off in the sherry cask yeah. or another cask. And sometimes it, it might be Umeshu, which is a sweet traditional yeah. uh, wine from Japan. Um, and, and it may be other things as well. There's quite a few traditional drinks there. Now, not to get too controversial here, but YouTube does love a little bit of controversy. Yeah. Um, there is kind of a, a I guess a, a bit of a discussion going on with Japanese whiskey at the moment because um, as you said there's so much demand and not necessarily enough supply and the um, regulations are not as tight in Japan as they are for instance in Scotland as to what can actually be called a scotch yeah. um, so we have seen some brands coming on the market where 
um, the whiskey is actually made in Scotland and then brought over to Japan and bottled and therefore commands a bit of a higher price yeah. point because it's it's a Japanese whiskey yeah. and that's very popular. Yes. Um, what you know? Do you think? How, what do you think of that practice? I guess. So. Well, I think there's there's two kinds, two distinct kinds to think about. So there's there's whiskies that um, that present themselves like Ichiro's as being a well blended whiskey and they're they're blended with um, Canadian, Scottish, Irish, American, and so Japanese they're very whiskey. Upfront, they're like this is what. In this yeah, they say it on the label and that's really, really clear that's what they're doing. And they're not trying to get a brand price for their product, they're just trying to make a really good blended product that works really well. And they, they, they have, it's a beautiful whiskey. And also Suntory do it with um, their, uh, it's, a, it's AO is the name of the whiskey. And it's yeah. a limited release and it's a worldwide blend of including uh, Hibiki and Yamazaki. And so there's a few guys doing that. And um, a couple of these two have some blends in them. Um, this one as well. Um, I think that's okay as long as it's part of the of, the, of creating the product and you're up, open and honest about it. Yeah. But then there's a second kind of category where people are pretending that they're Japanese whiskies um, and they're really just cheap whiskies from Scotland, bulk produced whiskies that are being bottled up. Some of those are, well, it's, it's sort of disingenuous is the main problem. They might, they might be okay and drinkable, but it's yeah. just disingenuous because you'd be able to buy the same whiskey somewhere else a lot cheaper. But I think one thing you want to be wary of is just new Japanese whiskey bands popping up out of nowhere, you know, brands just you haven't like heard of. like some Japanese words on a, on a label and you're like... That's right, yeah, because yeah, if they don't have that, that distillery history, you've got to be a little bit wary about where they're coming from and who's producing them. Um, and, you know, if you start seeing a brand pop up in big volumes really cheaply in a major liquor retailer, I think you'd be wary of those. Yeah, that's the top tip, I guess, for making sure that you're getting your money's worth because <clears> obviously some of the prices that, that some of the Japanese whiskies are commanding um, nowadays are, are pretty eye-watering. Yeah, have yeah. You, have you had the chance to try any of the kind of, you know, the Hibiki 21s and the, um, you know, the stuff that's kind of disappeared off, off shelves? pretty much entirely at the moment. Yes, look, I'm, I'm really lucky. My, my father-in-law collects a lot of uh, Japanese whiskey, so I've got to try most of the that good ones, lucky. up to about the Yamazaki 25-year-old, which yeah. is about 7,000 a bottle now. Um, we drink quite a bit of the uh, Hibiki 21, which is very good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're getting, they're getting out of <laughs> to drink. I can't afford to drink them anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. It's nice yeah. that you got the chance. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you, James. I think that was a very comprehensive insight into the history of Japanese whiskey um, to get us started. Uh, please like and subscribe because there will be another episode coming up where we have a look at some of the bottles in front of us in a little bit more detail and you don't want to miss it. <laughs>